now on News Talk 105.9 WMAL. Vince Colonnese. Well, good afternoon to you. 406 here at News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we are making sense of the news. Coming up, Harmie Dillon will join us in the next hour. We'll talk about so much legal news with her. Also, the Biden administration's attempts to censor your speech online. More and more documents coming out about that. Harmeet will weigh in on all of it. And you can join us at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. Let's bring in now the excellent David Strom. He's an associate editor over at the excellent Hot Air. David, good to have you back with us, sir. All right, it's good to be back, and I'll send your check for saying nice things. I try to every time, and I and you don't have to send a check. I, I actually really enjoy your website. It, it's uh, very well organized. You got a bunch of great writers, and and uh, you among them are, are very excellent. And um, I I I'm interested uh, in everything you're writing about uh, these days. Um, I, one of the things that you and I talk about is a lot is the craziness of the left. Uh, and earlier this week, I was discussing this NBC piece about um, <laughs> about people who think they can change their race by watching these YouTube videos. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Isn't it amazing that you're not allowed to change your race, but you can change your gender? Isn't that one of the most remarkable current features of the the left's rules? Well, uh, you know, what's so fascinating about it is, is that race actually is on a spectrum. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, clearly there's a very strong genetic component to it. But, you know, my wife got her DNA tested and she has like 10 uh, percent African, 20 percent Native American, sure. uh, uh, Spanish. I mean, her mother's ancestors came over as conquistadors. So, you know, by now there's been so much racial blending that it's just all over the map. Yes. Uh, whereas sex is exactly the opposite. No matter how many times, uh, how many generations, you either come out male or female. Exactly. And yet the left completely inverse those two things. I mean, you read the MB NBC story and you've got the sort of bizarre uh, analysis where race is not real. They have to insist that it's socially constructed, but you can't change it. It's totally set in stone. Yes. And it's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and it's interesting, you know, you talk about race being on a spectrum. I hadn't really even contemplated it this way, but yeah, I mean, people are, all, they're, they're mixed. Most people are a mixed up bag of all sorts yeah. of things. Uh, you know, Barack Obama, half white, half black, but we think of him just as a black guy. That's the way that, you know, that's the way he, he presents himself, and that's the way people talk about him. So everyone kind of just nods along and agrees. Uh, but this idea that it's immutable, you can't change it, yet it's also a social construct. It's totally incoherent. NBC's argument is it's it's imagined, it's completely invented, it's a social construct, and you can't change it. Oh, yeah, and they they also say it's inherited. So it's an, so uh, you mean it's genetic, you know, if it's inherited. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, it's not like money. I mean, so, I mean, it's just it, – it's incoherent uh, description of things. Do you and think a majority of people buy all this crap? Is this – this this sounds – this seems like narrow casting. This is like the, only a select group – of elites who are just complete narcissists would be would would adhere to this ideology do normal people think this way do they all ascribe to this or is this just the bizarro world on display in the nb in nbc well it's bizarro world for any adult but this is being taught in the school and it's being taught as science so, uh, you know, we're getting this sort of constant barrage of trust the science, trust the science. And by now, most adults sort of look around and think, you know, there's a lot of BS floating out there. So I'm going to read up on it. Yes. But then their kids come home and, you know, they're just getting this constant steady stream of propaganda. And so I do think it has an impact on them, which is why... Uh, if you look generation by generation, things that used to be 
uh, you know, extraordinarily unusual. Uh, about 0.02 percent of the population pretty consistently over the entire time that we've ever studied this uh, considered themselves transgender. You know, and this was based upon clearly something went wrong hormonally. Uh, you know, there was. Uh, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, okay, so something went wrong hormonally, uh, and, you know, with them, and it's 0.02%. Now it's around 5%. That is not some major genetic change. That's yes. the propaganda. You have a so, piece up. You have a piece up today on this on transgender ideology. Your headline is "The Real Message of Trans Ideology: Hate Yourself." What do you mean? Well, that is the real message. I mean, we keep on. It's sold to us as we need to accept people as who they are. Yeah. Right. You know, this is my identity, but uh, it really is selling the exact opposite of that to people who are being convinced that they're transgender. You have to lop off parts of your body in order to be who you really are. Who you really are is not who you were born as. It's not who God made you as. Uh, it is something fundamentally different and so fundamental that uh, it requires medical intervention that didn't even exist 20 years ago, right? Uh, uh, medical intervention to turn to turn you into what's really you, and you know it's the same thing, uh, uh, you know, as telling kids that you know you're right to be anorexic. You really are fat, and you ought to hate your body as it is. Uh, rather than you know, it's moving away from health uh, towards self self hatred. That's what it is. You know, in a lot of these big debates, one of the through lines seems to be the amount of money that's on the line uh, with yep. with the ideology. So in the transgender stuff, there are entire industries that revolve around hacking up people uh, or injecting them with chemicals and then keeping them on, quote, treatment for the rest of their lives to the tune of hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. Uh, in, in the case of COVID, for instance, with the COVID jabs, you had big pharmaceutical companies whose uh, reputations and incomes were on the line. So even basic questions about efficacy and side effects uh, were were cons were treated as conspiracy theories and crazy talk uh, from people who were just asking basic questions uh, about these things in the in the interest of enriching these big pharmaceutical companies. With with regards to like the Ukraine debate, to what extent do we continue to sustain our involvement in Ukraine? There is a tremendous amount of money on the line. There's defense contractors who are entirely dependent on this. And, and so what ends up happening is in many of these debates, uh, David Strom, you're watching as uh, people are being silenced in order to preserve massive financial interests uh, and to make sure that their golden goose doesn't get touched. Oh, that's uh, absolutely correct. And you can go into the global warming uh, clean energy scam that's going on right now. I mean, we're we're talking about billions and eventually trillions of dollars. I mean, John Kerry uh, said, I think, last year that it should be about a trillion and a half dollars a year that should be going into clean energy. Well, when you're talking about that kind of money and then you're expecting everyone to, to you know, tell you the God's honest truth, I mean, that happens nowhere. Right. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, when you've got that kind of money on the line, people will spin you. I mean, Matt Walsh, uh, about a year ago, uh, got some videos from the University of Tennessee that actually showed, uh, you know, a hospital administrator saying we've got to expand our, our gender surgery and gender uh, identity care because it's millions of dollars in our pocket. I mean, yes. we just put it on the line. Uh, and, you know, why anyone would believe that money has no impact on the decision making and that this is purely about helping kids? Uh, you know, why you would 
at least not be skeptical yes. is beyond me. The same thing with abortion, by the way. There's big, big, there's big money yep. in keeping women at work and away from children. Uh, that's that's a that's a huge thing, and that's why corporate America is constantly pushing abortion down everybody's throats. Um, let me. Uh, uh, I'm talking to you today, of course, David, from Washington D.C. And, and as we're speaking, Trump is still inside this D.C. courthouse for uh, his third indictment, his second from the Biden administration. What do you make of what we're witnessing right now? Well, I think that this, uh, you know, this is about the election. I mean, and it's about protecting Joe Biden. I mean, whatever you think of Donald Trump, one way or the other, I mean, you just have to look at the sequence of events. The two indictments uh, that came from the Biden administration both happened one day after a really bad news for Joe Biden came out. Uh, You know, this last one with the the Devin Archer testimony, you know, providing what amounts to irrefutable evidence that Joe Biden was in a scheme with Hunter Biden and Ukrainian officials and that he lied about the China connections. And, you know, Boom, that's off the front pages because Donald Trump is, uh, you know, he's got another indictment. And this this latest indictment is based upon, you know, as flimsy a uh, a legal theory as uh, the Manhattan indictment. So, I mean, at least you've got substance. It's questionable substance, but substance to the uh, document scandal. I mean, he actually kept documents that he wasn't supposed to keep. Uh, Now, how big a deal that is, what they've spun out of it, you know, it's, you know, to me, it looks like a very weak case. And certainly, you know, is no, no worse than what Hillary Clinton did, Joe Biden did with his documents. But this case is basically Donald Trump is a bad guy. You know, and he said, uh, uh, well, know, they, they're they claiming that he true. said things that were wrong in public. He said the wrong things in public. Yeah. That's essentially the, the whole the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, and that he Have knew better. The and there's dossier. Right. Yeah. The steel dossier. Yeah. yeah. Nobody charged for that. But yeah. but they don't have any evidence, as I mentioned at the, the outset of the program today. They don't have they in order to prove that he did something wrong here. Supposedly, they have to get to his state of mind. They don't have a single piece of evidence that they presented in the indictment that he, quote, knew he lost the election or that he had said to people that he had lost the election. They don't have a single shred of evidence to that effect. They have in the indictment. They have people saying that to him. Oh, you lost the election or, oh, there's not not enough fraud here for us to say that you won the election. But that's not that's not his state of mind that's outside advisors telling him all sorts of things and is trump has trump ever been known david strom to go his own way <laughs> or to have a uh, uh, you know let's assume you know uh, he lost the election fair and square uh and uh you know but donald donald trump has sort of a reality distortion field you know he sees things you know and it's the secret to his success. I mean, he just creates his own reality and it works most of the time for him. So yeah, this whole, you know, they call it mens rea, you know, the awareness of guilt. You couldn't possibly establish that for for Donald Trump. And, you know, (laughs) frankly, again, it is no different. I mean, you could find Uh Democrats uh, denying the 2016 election for years. You know, there there's an there are entire industries that revolve trying to get inside Donald Trump's brain. Uh, I yeah. guarantee you, Jack Smith can't do that. That's not possible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, hey David Strom, thank you very much from Hot Air. Always good to talk to you, sir. I love it. Thanks, Vince. All right, that's David, and uh, it is four twenty now. Stream us live online wherever you are, whenever you want. Download the new WMAL app today. Uh, We tried to go for Phil earlier. We've got him now. Line one, Phil in Fredericksburg. Phil, good afternoon to you. Oh, no. Come on, Phil. Uh, This is twice in a... Yeah, I'm here. Oh, there he is. All right, go ahead, Phil. Hey, look, you know, Joe Biden finally turned us into communist China. It's now the United States of communist China. I mean, I've never seen anything like this in my life. I'm so upset. Let's put all those words we can't say on the radio in a line and put Biden behind it because 
he has really put a job on us. You know, this has to stop. A hundred percent. This has to stop. This really does. It's it's amazing what we're seeing. Phil, I, I think a lot of people are waking up to this, though. People who were not awake before. Do you agree? Yeah, well, I hope so, because, look, I mean, this is exactly how the Soviet Union treated people. They said, show me the man and I'll show you the crime. The implication was nobody was guilty who was against the party. And the Biden administration is trying to push a one-party America. It's crazy. It is crazy. Phil, thank you. I'm glad we got that call in. Let me get Hoke in Round Hill here. Hoke on line three. Good afternoon. Hello. Hey, as inexplicable as this is, Lisa Murkowski actually said something intelligent today. Um, She made a comment that she voted to impeach the president over the actions of January 6th, which is the constitutionally prescribed remedy. Yes. So if that's the case and he was tried by the House and not removed, how is this not double jeopardy? This is a fantastic question. Trump says it is. Trump says it is double jeopardy. You said you heard Murkowski say that she believes this is double jeopardy? No, no. Murkowski just said that that she voted to impeach him over these issues, and I don't think she realized – she didn't have the intellect to realize that she made Trump's case for him. I see. Yeah, no, Trump said in November of last year – uh, he uh-huh. he told a group at the America First Policy Institute Gala, uh, at, held at Mar-a-Lago, uh, that he believed that he can't be indicted for January 6th because that would be double jeopardy. The United States Congress has already considered all of this and acquitted him, uh, and now he's facing these charges today. Trump, by the way, has now pled not guilty to all of these counts but we'll see. We'll see if his attorneys present uh, this double jeopardy argument as well, because it certainly seems like it from where we're sitting. All right. Coming up, the scandal that could take down the Biden administration. Devin Archer testifying this week, the business partner to the Biden family. And boy, does he have something to say. The transcript now out. News Talk 105.9 WMAL. Making sense of the news. Well, good afternoon to you. It is 435 here at Newstalk 105.9 WMAL, where we are making sense of the news. You can join us today at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. We'll be joined coming up by Harmeet Dillon. We'll get into the Hunter Biden, Joe Biden, Devin Archer, Tony Bobulinski, Gal Luft, Burisma, Zlovshevsky saga. There's... So many players. Chairman Yi, you got a lot of characters in this, in this corrupt family business. And again, you can join us at 888-630-9625. That's what Steve is doing. Bethesda, Maryland, line one. Steve, good afternoon. You're on the Vince Colony Show. Hi, Vince. Thanks for taking my call. Yes, sir. Listen, I just heard, I just heard the last part of your uh, previous interview, uh, and I just wanted to make a point. Uh, you talked about double indemnity. But it's really important to remember that the um, impeachment and you know trial of a president in the Senate is a totally political action. Uh, it's not legal. Mm-hmm. So, if, for example, if the president had – if Trump had been found uh, guilty by the Senate, he simply would have been removed. But there's no legal uh, penalty to that. It's a political process. Right. That's why he could be – that's why he could be charged, you know, for these crimes, et cetera. Uh, it's a totally separate thing. Yeah, right. So you're saying that double jeopardy is not something that he he couldn't he couldn't uh, use this as a defense against this trial. Say it's double jeopardy. Uh, of course, he is arguing. Uh, he has been arguing that this is double jeopardy. And in terms of the spirit of the law, just our understanding of why we have rules about not putting people into double jeopardy. Uh, Jack Smith is certainly violating that. That's definitely happening. But as a legal question, uh, your point is uh, that this is a separate from a political process. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The two are the two are different processes. And so consequently, the whole double jeopardy thing, while while it has the appearance of double jeopardy, you know, in, in terms of spirit or whatever. Right. It's legally they're two legally different things. Yes. Well, as a normative matter, it should not be happening. And yet here we are. Uh, Steve. Absolutely. Steve, yes. thank you yes. very much for okay. the call. Um, yeah. So so Trump, you know, just pled not guilty to all of this. The judge has set a hearing date of August 28th 
for uh, this case. So uh, that'll it'll all barrel along. It'll continue, and and the Biden administration will continue to meddle in the election using how much how many millions of taxpayer dollars are being expended on this uh, as in kind contributions to the Biden campaign. A lot, a lot of money, a lot of money, and not just the money for the court proceedings, not just to pay the lawyers. But of course, you know the judges have to be paid. That's they're paid from the federal government. The security apparatus that needs to be set up. The immense uh, costs that come with moving a Secret Service protectee all around the country in order to keep this court proceeding going. It, it's just on and on and on. It's all on you. You are paying for this attack on the republic. We all are. Um, meanwhile, Devin Archer testified at the beginning of the week. Devin Archer. He is Hunter Biden's longtime business partner, and he had some words to say. And I, and I played some audio for you yesterday from his interview with uh, Tucker Carlson this week, uh, which was fascinating, when Archer laid out uh, so many of the times where Joe Biden was actively involved in the family's business dealings overseas while he was vice president of the United States. Let me just do a, a quick recap for you of some of the Devin Archer Um, statements to Tucker, and then we'll get into the ways that that kind of matches up with the transcript just released by the House Oversight Committee. So you worked with Hunter Biden in a bunch of different businesses. Um, What were the skill, the specific skills that he brought to clients? Well, at the end of the day, he, you know, he had a career in Washington, uh, graduated Yale Law School and had a very big network in in D.C. and brought that know-how and understanding of D.C. and ultimately the Biden brand. The know-how. So as far as I could tell, he wasn't doing legal work. I Correct. mean, he wasn't in the counsel's office at Burisma, right? No, mm-hmm. no. So the the network and the Biden brand sounds like the, the kind of key component of Absolutely. what yeah. he was bringing. Yep. Um, do you think that he would have been in those businesses, not having a business background, without his father being in a government position? It's hard to speculate in, in those regards. I mean, yeah. I think when we initially met and uh, and he talked about his advisory business, his business that needed to transition from lobbying to advisory and the interest in private equity, it seemed, uh, you know, it seemed like a new and interesting network for us to expand our business. Um, whether he could have, you know, been in that position, it's it's hard for me to speculate. Right. But obviously, the brand of Biden, you know, adds a lot of power when you're dad's vice president. Yeah, when your dad's the vice president. So here's here's something to know. And Devin Archer, I, I will say, in all of this testimony, you detect something in the way that he's presenting himself that um, we should highlight. He speaks in a lot of euphemisms, and he's squirrely. Have you noticed this? He doesn't just use direct phrasing. He doesn't say things like, yeah, the only reason Hunter was getting all of this money is because of who his dad is. He's never that direct. He doesn't speak that directly. Instead, he kind of talks around it. Well, yeah, maybe it was kind of it's the connection to his dad, and there was a lot going on. Obviously, there's weight to his father's relationship. Stop playing games. Look, Devin Archer would not be working with Hunter Biden if it weren't for the fact that Joe Biden is Hunter's father. There's no question about this. Hunter's acumen has never been used as a justification for any of this. It's always been about his dad. It's always been about Joe. And so it's, it is it is weird to listen to Devin Archer. He's re- revealed, I think, a lot of very interesting, compelling information this week. But it's a bit like pulling teeth to get it out of him. He's very squirrely about this. I, I do have to say, in terms of his legal woes right now, he does have um, an outstanding appeal for a criminal sentence that he's in the midst of right now. Uh, he was sentenced to a year and a day in prison last year by a New York federal court for defrauding an Indian tribe here in the United States. Devin Archer was. But right now the sentence is stayed pending an appeal. And so he's got some outstanding legal issues, in other words, and I'm not sure to what extent they are playing into the way he's answering these questions. Part of me thought that maybe Devin Archer's testifying in this way this week to rattle the Biden family cages. That he's out there saying, you know I know everything, right? You know I know every last detail. So I'm going to start, I'm just going to fire a warning shot across your bow. And if you don't help me out of the mess I'm in, i.e. give me a pardon, well, I'm going to keep talking. 
I'm going to keep telling this story. So he goes to the House Oversight Committee hearing this week. He goes and speaks to Tucker Carlson. He's still speaking kind of in euphemisms, kind of making defenses for Hunter's behavior. But every so slightly, he's offering more and more evidence that, yeah, Joe was definitely involved. Devin Archer and Tucker talking about Hunter Biden's, quote, regulatory expertise. The initial idea around the business, they were going to provide you know, the government insight and an additional network to raise capital and then, you know, deal with regulatory issues that you might have at the corporate level. Right. Regulatory issues. Exactly. Okay. So that would be more his area. Right. That would be his space. Right. But did he have a, a sophisticated understanding of regulation, do you think? Um, I think that he led a team that had, had, a, had a sophisticated... <laughs> okay. Because I lived in Washington a long time around a lot of regulation. Also a very complex area. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think there's, you know, you got to be an expert in knowing the guy. And he was the guy that was the expert in knowing the guy. He was an expert in knowing the guy. Right. And who was the guy he knew? Uh, guy. Well, he knew a lot of people, but obviously yeah. there was some familiar, you know, some, his brother, his father. Uh, yeah. Uh, Listen some, to this his, guy. His so, see, oh, sorry. Okay. Listen to this. I love how he leads in a series, right? So he's giving a series in the sentence. He says, he, he you know, he knows, like, for instance, his brother, comma, his father, Okay, will you stop? It's not his brother that's the issue here. Uh, it's his dad. It's his dad. It is Joe Biden. Joseph Robinette Biden is who we're talking about. And so even in this, I, I, although Devin is admitting that it's about wielding his father in order to make all this money, and his father playing along as vice president of the United States, accepting bribes, which is impeachable, bribes into the family. He says, well, his brother and his father. Uh, well, he knew a lot of people, but obviously yeah. there was some familiar, you know, some his brother, his father, uh, yeah. uh, some of his, his father's siblings. So he, he knew a lot of people. And, and obviously I know you're pointing to, you know, the father being the key relationship. That's well, true. no, I, I'm just trying to get a sense of like, Washington's not a money town. Right. You know, people don't aren't in business in Washington for the right. most part, and most people don't have business skills that I noticed in 30 years of living there. Um, so really, the business of Washington is is selling access. That's what it looked like to me. Yeah. And so Devin Archer agrees. This is where so Tucker convinced him to to be plain spoken at least on this point. Yeah, no, that's I think that's. Do. I mean, I think that's the one of the like core misconceptions. I mean, it seems like when I you know understanding a regulatory environment means selling access at the end of the day. That, yeah. That's how I interpret it. And I think that's how most people on, you know, on Wall Street, whether they admit it or not, interpret it. Selling access. Hunter, what was Hunter Biden selling? Class, anybody? Access. Yes, that's, that's exactly what Devin Archer said. Now, I want to emphasize a detail about this word access this week and that we now know, courtesy of the House Oversight Committee releasing the full transcript of their hours-long interview with Devin Archer. He never used the phrase illusion of access. Devin Archer never told Congress, Tucker, anybody else that Hunter was selling the illusion of access. That is a Democrat Party talking point this week that they invented, that they have introduced into the conversation. Hunter was only selling the illusion of access. In other words, Joe Biden wasn't guilty of anything. His son's just a con man. That's that's the frame up here. Archer never said that. He said Hunter was selling access. Access. Meaning to Joe. That's what, it, that's what that means. I just wonder, like, when you hear people say, well, it's kind of an open question. Right. About why they hired Hunter Biden. Like, that's pretty disingenuous, no? Right. I think at the end of it, so when you look at the whole, there, there are people that maybe were, you know, sons or relatives or brother-in-laws of other high-ranking officials. But I think what we ran into and w with what Hunter ran into was like almost like an Icarus issue. So he got a little, it was too close to the sun. It was too right. good to be true. And the connections were, were too close and the scrutiny too much. Yes. And it ended up destroying, you know, he it left a wake of a lot of, dis, you know, a lot of destruction in business over a number of years. You know. So how many, um, it's been reported and you have said that there were occasions when uh, Joe Biden would call in with clients present on a speaker phone. Right. How, how many times do you think that happened? I mean, over a 10 year partnership, I would, uh, you know, the number I'm going with is 20. That's probably the, the, the amount that I so a lot. kind of record. Yeah, a lot. You could say. So Joe Biden, who's very much a product of Washington. That's one other detail to emphasize. Um, Archer says it was a lot. 
He, he that was his those were his words a lot. He said uh, this week you are hearing Democrats claim it was just twice a year. This is over the course of ten years. It's like twice a year. What, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? Now I from where I'm sitting, having not been on in on any of these calls, not hanging out in Dubai with these guys, not sitting in on the the hearing. Let me just tell, my my educated guess here as to what really happened. It was a lot more than twenty. It was a lot more than twenty. I think, I think Devin is trying to take a little spin off the ball here. He's trying to say, uh, uh, yeah, it's not. Was it maybe over twenty? It was probably a lot more than that. Um, but look, he's the guy testifying. He says twenty. But and then he says a lot. Of course, must have known that he was calling in to effectively a business meeting that his son was having. I mean, he must have understood that 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 was kind of what his son was selling. Well, that's, I mean, it's hard for me to speculate on that. <laughs> See, look how squirrely he is. But in the end, he, he knows what's actually going on. And Tucker bas- get, basically gets him to admit it over and over. I guess my question, just to keep it to the facts, Joe Biden, then the sitting vice president, knew that there were Hunter's business associates in the room. Yeah, I think I can, I can definitively say at particular dinners or meetings, he knew there were business associates and he, you know, we, or if I was there, I was a business associate too. Yeah. Um, so I think, or if, you know, any of the other colleagues from the DC office or the New York office were there. So yeah, at times there were from the, you know, to be, you know, completely clear on the calls. Here we go. I don't know if it was an orchestrated call in or not. It certainly was powerful though, because powerful. You know, if you're sitting with a foreign business person and you hear the vice president's voice, that's prize enough. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty impactful stuff. What does it mean to be powerful or impactful? It means to affect an outcome. And what's the outcome that they desire? It's cash money. They want money. And so when Joe Biden gets on the phone with the business partners, what ensues? Money. Money flows right into Hunter Biden's pocket. This is a point at which I want to emphasize that you hear a lot of conservative commentators right now, great people, all, But emphasizing that we have to figure out to what extent Joe got this money in order to establish how much he was personally enriched, that is irrelevant. In a sense, that's that's goalpost shifting in terms of just crossing the threshold of of corruption and bribery. He is we already know without any more evidence. And we John Solomon and I talked about this yesterday. We don't need any more evidence to know that Joe Biden enriched his family through his corrupt behavior. He got on those phone calls to enrich Hunter Biden in issue areas where Joe was tasked with handling U.S. policy. That's it. Burisma was paying Hunter a million dollars a year. Joe Biden went in and got the prosecutor who was investigating Burisma fired in Ukraine. Joe Biden spoke to Hunter Biden's Burisma business partners on the phone in order to ensure that his son got that million dollar a year payday. Joe didn't take that call for, it wasn't, it wasn't, oh, like, let me talk to a random friend. Let me give him a pick me up. No, this was about making sure that Hunter got his check. You don't need any more evidence than that. This is, at this point, we have reached, you open a case, you shut a case. We are now open and shut on Joe Biden's involvement in a corrupt scheme to enrich his family. To what extent did he have a personalized credit card that tapped into that account? Sure, we can look into that detail, but we don't even need it. It's completely irrelevant. Biden's corruption was getting in on getting on the phone, facilitating the bribe, getting it to his kid, delivering the thing that the people who were bribing the Biden family wanted. We know all of this. All right, I've got more for you out of Devin Archer this week. It's 451. Be a part of the conversation and stay informed. Follow WMALDC on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Yeah, we'll have the uh, brilliant Harmeet Dillon joining us coming up here in a few minutes. We'll talk more about the Biden family's legal woes, all of the crimes that they seem to have committed. Um, Devin Archer's testimony this week includes declaring that the Biden family intimidated would-be threats to their income streams. According to the House Oversight uh, 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 transcript, it confirmed that Archer extensively discussed, the New York Post writes here, the value that Hunter brought to Burisma as a part of the Biden family brand. Under questioning from Democratic lawyers, Devin Archer mused that, quote, I think Burisma would have gone out of business if it didn't have the, quote, brand 
attached to it. That led Congressman Dan Goldman, you know, the Levi Strauss heir, the Democrat from New York, to to ask some questions. He's like, I don't understand. Why why did uh, he have an impact? What was that? How would that work? And Archer told him, because people would be intimidated to mess with them. That is the Biden family. Legally, he clarified. Legally? Mess with Burisma? They'd be intimidated by the Bidens? What kind of people? Well, I don't know. Maybe Ukrainian prosecutors? Could be. Coming up, Harmeet Dillon with a reaction to all of it. Stay with us. News Talk 105.9 WMAL. Making sense of the news.